Welcome to Bridging the Gap Formal Custom Verification. I'm your host, Rick Eversoll. Today we're going to talk about the ESP transistor model. We're going to get started by looking at how other simulators model the transistor. We're not going to look at the BSIM-4 or the compact device models themselves. We're going to keep this at a very high level. But the most common simulators are SPICE accurate, and such as HSPICE from Synopsys. They use a very accurate but slow device model. This is good for hundreds, maybe tens of thousands of devices. It uses a full IV curve and it uses a large signal model. Full IV curve models like used in HSPICE are great for analog and RF designs, but for custom digital designs you don't need that level of accuracy. You can gain much performance and capacity by using a piecewise linear model. Custom Sim for Synopsys is an example of a simulator in this spice. These simulators allow you to simulate tens of thousands, maybe a few million, maybe up to 10 million devices by using this model. For fastest performance, treat the transistor as a pure switch, ignoring delays, current, and voltage. Just use logic levels such as VCS. For situations where you have multiple drivers and or, and or feedbacks, you have to take care with this. If you want the ultimate in performance, skip out of transistor level analysis completely and go to RTL or behavioral level modeling. You'll notice this leaves a gap in our chart. Sending the gap between custom sim and VCS is the ESP device model. It's a simple switch model with a resistance and capacitance. This works great for digital designs. This allows us to work with self-timed logic and also can resolve dr drive fights. So let's look in more detail with this ESP transistor model. It's a three terminal device model. There's a gate, a strain, and source pins. There is no bulk connection. We simply ignore that in your netlist. There's a channel resistance, a gate, and a channel capacitance. This is a MOS-only model, does not support BJTs nor SOI functionality. There are two types of models you have access to. From 7 nanometers to 180 nanometers, there's a built-in table that supports planar and FinFET devices. And if you want more accuracy, there's a, there's a methodology for device model simulation to fill out those parameters for the channel resistance and the capacitances. The default model in ESP is based upon the Arizona Predictive Technology models. Its advantages are it runs from 180 to, two to 7 nanometers. It supports planar, FTSOI, and FinFET. You don't actually need a SPICE model. This is built, the table's built into ESP. Disadvantages are that you only get a single N and a single P device scaled to your net list. There's no support for different VTHs, and the model does not support any specific foundry. It's, it's a generic model. You also must specify the names of the devices unless they happen to start with P or N. If you can't live with the built-in table models used by ESP, then you can use device model simulation methodology to generate a set of models specific to your foundry. Advantages here are it will support any type of device model, multiple P's and N's, different VTH's, there's no limit on the type of namings that you can use. Disadvantages are you must actually have the SPICE model to be used with your simulator, and these models must be created using either HSPICE or FindSim from Synopsys. So we talked about the ESP device transistor model, but how does that model actually get used? Here we're going to show you a simple network with the digital waveform inputs that we're going to talk about as we move on. So now looking at this circuit, initially when you start out, the h by simulator will tell you that Z is going to be a 1 at the beginning time within what you see here in the waveforms. Then as A1 transitions to the 1 position, that will turn transistor M1 off, leaving no drivers on the net except for the charge stored in C. Then a little bit of leakage will start to transition. You'll see that if you wait long enough. But then A2 comes along, it goes active high, and now the transistor M2 is on. It wants to pull the node down to a zero. And it will do that with some, some amount of delay, and you'll see that in your HSPICE simulations. And then as A3 transitions on a little bit later, now you'll transition even faster to drive this network to a zero. 
Now let's look what ESP does with this same network. ESP being a digital simulator, you'll never actually see decays in the voltage over time. Instead, ESP calculates a delay and at the point where the event is supposed to occur, it will transition from a one to a zero. And that's what you'll see in the waveforms like you do here. Specifically in this particular design, what you'll see is that when A1 went high, ESP will want to make the output go to Z. And so it schedules an event five nanoseconds out in the future, which is the default, but you can change that. And then what happens then, A2 comes along, it goes high, which puts a driver on here that wants to make it go zero. And so you'll calculate a delay based on R2 times C. And that number's a little bit of forward of where you actually see this transition. And finally, A3 comes along and it transitions. And now you have a delay based on the resistances of R2, R3, and C. And you'll see ESP will schedule that event. And once that time is reached, the transition will actually occur. Thank you for sticking around for the end. We talked about the simple RC switch model used within ESP. It's very fast, has functional timing, allows you to resolve functional strength issues, and it's good for digital design. We also talked about the default models used within ESP. Finally, we talked about how to use foundry-specific models within ESP. Thanks for sticking around and look forward to seeing you in future episodes of Bridging the Gap.